week's topic is the redeeming light. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it and your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Arhans Yogananda. The book of Isaiah in the Bible, chapter 9, tells us, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. What is this light of which so many scriptures speak? In Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, we read of an early experience the Master had with that light. I was blessed about the age of eight with a wonderful healing through the photograph of Lahiri Mahashai. This experience gave intensification to my divine love. While at our family estate in Hinchapur, Bengal, I was stricken with Asiatic cholera. My life was despaired of. The doctors could do nothing. At my bedside, mother frantically motioned me to look at Lahiri Mahashai's picture on the wall above my head. Bow to him mentally. She knew I was too feeble even to lift my hands in salutation. If you really show your devotion and inwardly kneel before him, your life will be spared. I gazed at his photograph and saw there a blinding light enveloping my body and the entire room. My nausea and other uncontrollable symptoms disappeared. I was well. At once, I felt strong enough to bend over and touch Mother's feet in appreciation of her immeasurable faith in her guru. Mother pressed her head repeatedly against that little picture. O oh, omnipresent Master, I thank Thee that Thy light hath healed my son. I realized that she too had witnessed the luminous blaze through which I had instantly recovered from a usually fatal disease. Where my light is, God once told a saint whom the divine light had healed, no darkness can dwell. The divine light, pure, calm, liberating, is the only final cure for every kind of delusion. Ill health, emotional grief, and spiritual ignorance. Seek it daily in the silence, in deep meditation. As the Bhagavad Gita says in the fifth chapter, for whom that darkness of the soul is chased by light. Splendid and clear shines manifest the truth, as if a sun of wisdom sprang to shed its beams of light. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. especially when the sun is shining. <laughs> I'm going to begin with that reading from Whispers from Eternity. This is demand that God respond. These are prayer demands, and it would be a very, very good thing for you to get uh, this book, Whispers from Eternity. And Master in this essentially does prayer demands for all kinds of different situations. And so whenever you feel yourself to be in need of some grace, find the appropriate one. And actually it would be good for you to memorize that and, and beam off the call to God to respond in that way. So this is the demand that God respond. Today, Father, thou hast come into my temple. With thy coming, all the lights of my sense service have sprung to life, and the door of my heart has been opened wide. Thy blessing has driven away the darkness of ages, 
sending its heavy vapors, fleeing at the first glance of thy approach. The loud beating drums of my craving announce thy manifestation, the incense of devotion, riding, rising from the incenser of my soul, wafts upward to thee. O oh, bless me always, respond to me whenever I call thee. Be a good one to learn and repeat. So I want to talk partly about the light, the healing light, but I want to start by talking a little bit about healing because God does not need to use light to, as the vehicle for healing, but he often does. We have, we just heard this story of Master as a young child who was, his life was despaired of and was healed by the light from the picture. We have a friend in Italy who, when he was about 16 years old, his parents were somehow connected. I don't know if they were disciples of Master, but somehow connected with Master. At any rate, he wasn't at that age. But when he was about 16, he got a very bad disease, and his life was despaired of, and he was on his bed, and they didn't know whether he was going to make it through the night. And his mother had to go out for uh, some more medicine, so she left him and, you know, was going to return within 15, 20 minutes, something like that. At any rate, even in his weakened state, he could barely move, but he reached over. His mother had left a copy of the autobiography of a yogi on his bed stand. And he reached over and he took that and all he could do was hold it on over his heart and place his hands over it. And he said, as he did that, a beam of light came down and instantaneously healed him. And he sat up and was well. And from that time on, he was a disciple, is still a disciple of Yogananda. And so that beam of light came down in that sense and healed him. But he consciously called on that, or as well as he could in that we can say. But it doesn't always happen that way. We were told a story by a woman at our guest retreat, The Expanding Light, in, uh, I'm talking about Ananda Village in Northern California. She came one evening, and uh, hardly anyone was there, but a friend of ours was in the kitchen who was cooking, and she told us this story, that this woman came and said, I, I just had to come and tell somebody what happened to me. And she said, I was here a month or two ago, and when I was here, I, I don't even really know what you people do, I just felt to come here. And so I was here, and I was looking around, and I was shopping in the little boutique that you have, and I bought some things, and then I bought one of those little wallet-sized pictures of this, you know, the man with the long hair. <laughs> and, and I took it back, and I put it on, just on the bookshelf. She said, I've had a very hard life. She was a young woman. She said, I was engaged to be married, and my husband-to-be, my husband uh, many years ago, died of uh, uh, cancer that he had. And I went into a period of grieving after that, but I recovered. And then, again, I was engaged to be married, and just recently, my fiance was killed in a car accident. And I became very depressed and just felt that life was no longer worth living. And so I determined, decided to kill myself. And I was getting up to leave my room to go. I was going to get in my car and drive off a bridge and end my life. And that little picture grew and became life-size 
and stood in front of the door and blessed me. And she said, I just had to come. That, that then took away the desire to kill myself. And I just had to come and tell someone that story. And so we hear these stories. There was a, another story, those of you who've read the autobiography of the Yankee, know another story of the healing provided by the Hiri Mahashaya, where Sri Yukteswar, his disciple, had a, a close friend. And his life, the friend's life, was despaired of. And Sri Yukteswar came to his guru, uh, the Hiri Mahashaya, and asked him for healing. And, and uh, in, in this, uh, the Hiri said, I don't have any. And Sri Yukteswar was wise enough to say, well, ask that God flow through you. He said, oh, that's an entirely different thing. <laughs> and so he said, all right, I'll do that. And Sri Yukteswar came to his friend, went to his friend's house, but his friend was getting worse and worse. And he came back again to the hearing, and he said, my friend is getting worse, not better. And Lahiri said, there is no more chance that your friend is going to die than that the sun and the moon are going to exchange places in heaven. Go back, you'll be fine. So Sri Yukteswar goes back. And lo and behold, his friend is dead. And Sri Yukteswar is quite, uh, let's say his vrittis are not called. <laughs> So he comes back to the hero and tells him what has happened. And the hero says, you don't have enough faith. Take this oil and goes to the lamp and takes a little oil out of the lamp, gives it to him and says, go take this oil and place it on his lips. And so the tree of Deshwar does that. And the oil is placed on his lips and the fellow comes back into his body and is healed. And Sri Yukteswar goes back and kind of a, a little bit abashed, but also very grateful to Lahiri Mahashaya. And Lahiri simply says, I guess it was more convenient that your friend become healed than for the sun and the moon to experience. <laughs> but now there's another story, and this is one that most of you will not have also having to do with the Hiri Mahashaya. The Hiri and his wife had several children, and they had uh, two sons that we know about. They also had three girls. And at one point, one of the girls was married and became very ill. And uh, Kashi Moni, the wife of the Hiri, came and said, she's very ill, you've healed so many people. Can't you heal your own daughter also? And so the hero said, well, take a not particular kind of knot, I don't know what it was. Said, grind it up and into a powder and give that to her. So the wife goes to the house of the, of the, uh, the husband's family where the daughter is uh, living at the time. But they don't believe in anything spiritual. And they are convinced only of Western medicine. And so she doesn't feel that she can intrude on that. So she doesn't do what the jury has suggested, grind the powder and give it to her, and the daughter dies. And so she comes back and she's very saddened. And that evening, Lahiri is giving a class, as he always does. And the disciples who are there say, Master, you, you don't need to give a class this evening. You know, I'm sure you're upset, and we're upset, and your daughter died today. And the hero says, no, no, it's okay. We'll have our discourse on the Gita as usual. And they said, oh, please, you don't have to. He said, well, I'm 
I probably all do now. And they said, well, Master Wu told us that, to listen to a discourse. He said, well, in that case, then that's fine. And so they got up to leave, and one of them turned and said, please help me understand. Here your daughter has just died, and it doesn't seem to have faced you. Do you not love her? Wasn't it some sad thing that she died? And Lahiri gave a, an answer that I always remember. He said, I have received a blow much greater than the blow that any of you have received. He said, but you see, if you take a block of marble and you place it on another block of marble and you hit it, it does not leave an impression on the block of marble underneath. If you take that same block of marble and place it on soft mud and hit it, then it leaves an impression on that soft mud. He said, your minds have not yet become sufficiently uplifted into the light, and they're still soft, whereas my mind is like the granite underneath. Because the hearer could see beyond the mere one body or another body. He could see the life that goes on and on. So what does this mean? When I was with Ananda Moy Ma, I have a number of objects that people had sent over, and I asked her to bless them. And she said, don't you, why do you ask this body? to bless these. Don't you understand that God's grace is always flowing down? And so then she, you know, I still begged her to bless them. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. But see, God's grace is always flowing down. You would not be alive from the beginning of this sentence to the end without God's grace. The, the air that we breathe, the process of the, the body, all of that is God's grace. This is all God's dream. And so when we think about healing, the most important thing, see that Swami has used the image that God's grace is like the sun shining on a building. Does that sun not want to enter some rooms, avoid some rooms? but come into others? No, the sun is impartial. But some of those rooms have their shutters closed, and others have their shutters open. And so if we open our consciousness to God, God's grace will come in. It's still there. It's still trying to come in to everyone equally. God doesn't have favorites. We're all a part of God. We're all. One could say the cells of his one body. But why does energy flow to one cell and not to another cell? Because some cells won't receive it. But then there's the question of what about those cells that want to receive it and don't? Tens of thousands of people go to Lourdes every year. And they go there and say that taking those waters will heal them. And some are healed, a few are healed, some small percentage, but most of them aren't healed. And so does that mean that God is playing favorites? Does it mean, on the other hand, that all we have to do is ask for healing and we're given healing? Well, yes and no. See, we think healing is of the body because that's what's most obvious to us. And sometimes we receive healing and prayers are effective. You've had miracles in your own congregation of your prayers and of your kindness and of your drawing on the grace of God. And so often those things, those prayers are effective because everyone is open. That's why I played that chant. Uh, steal into my heart of hearts, banish my delusions. God does not always heal the body, but if we open our hearts to him, a much 
greater and more important healing takes place. And that's the healing of consciousness. And that healing always takes place. Whether the body is healed or not, our opening our hearts and our minds to God lifts our consciousness. And so I've a number of times counseled someone who's praying for a loved one. Don't necessarily expect that the physical conditions are going to change. You can expect that. You can even demand it in these prayer demands. But if it doesn't happen, don't feel that God wasn't present. What will happen if you pray and if that grace flows through your prayers, is that there will be an uplifting of consciousness, usually in the person that you're praying for, but always in you there will be an uplifting of consciousness. And that's the real miracle. Whether God says <coughs> light, or sound, a picture, some oil, some powder, all of that is irrelevant. <coughs> What is wrong is that we open our hearts and minds ever more deeply to God because the real, the real disease is not of the body, it is of the soul. And we should be open to the grace of God to uplift our consciousness. words uh, since we don't come often. I'm also admiring the rainbows that are <laughs> that there be light, the Atlas. One of the great gifts and insights of the teachings of India is that this world we live in is not the ultimate reality. They describe this as Maya, this delusion. And that this world that seems so real is made composed of opposites, of duality. So light and darkness, good and evil. And these come together in a very convincing virtual reality. But it's all that it is. Master used to take his disciples to the movie theater. Not that he particularly wanted to see the movie, he was trying to show them the nature of Maya. And just at the part, point of the movie where it would be absolutely engrossing, and Swami Kriyananda used to do this with us as well, Master would tap them on the shoulder and point to the beam of light coming from the projection booth. And he would say, it's all a play of light and shadows. And of course, this is echoed in the breakthroughs of great scientists, the great physicists, led uh, by the great pioneer and visionary and mystic, Albert Einstein. And as a young man, Einstein, we saw a documentary about his life. He was absorbed, and one might even say obsessed, with the concept of light. And he was growing up in Vienna, I believe, and he would go to his People who knew him as a young, uh, he was working as a clerk in a patent office, but he would come to the coffee shops with his friends and he would just talk about light. What is this light? What is it? How can we understand it better? And uh, one can imagine his friends didn't join him after a while. That was all he was going to be talking about. But, and it, this obsession with light led him to pursue the, the mechanics of life and finally led him to create the formula that the only constant, the only in thing that is not variable in the universe is the speed of light. And all of our concepts of time and space are based on the speed of light. But you know, even that is not 
the speed of light because light is a wave and a particle and you know the more it, as physics advances the more they don't really know what light is because light this light we are speaking of not the spectrum of rays that we see with our physical eyes but this light that we're speaking of the redeeming light the light within us shining is consciousness and that can never be measured can never be seen with the most subtle of instruments. And in Master's wonderful poem, Samadhi, in which he describes the state of consciousness where we really become one with light, with God, with the reality beyond duality. The first line of that beautiful poem is right there in your altar, on your temple. Banish the veils of light and shade. Lifted every vapor of sorrow. So the veils of light and shade, that's the light and shade of this world. But then all the rest of the poem, the reoccurring lines, he's always comparing the opposites. Love, hate, health, disease, life, death. But beyond that, he's saying, oh, all of this fades in the awareness of deep absorption in God. And we realize that these veils are not real. And there's a beautiful chapter, every chapter in autobiography is beautiful.
Just as we say every week in the Festival of Light, children of light, forsake the darkness. Know that forever you and he are one. And this is for every one of us the challenge and the core of what our church is about. Each one of us have come into this life with a different pathway to God, with different obstacles. Some of us, you know, sometimes, say, hi, Audie. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. I just said, it's an old, dear, dear friend and her daughter. <laughs> Wonderful. And um, so each one of us is faced with shadows with darkness, with challenges. And you can say, oh, well, look at that person. They never have any problems. No one who breathes the air of duality is without problems. And the essence of life is to see the light shining in the darkness. And why do they call it the redeeming light? Because it's there to transform us, to bring us out of darkness. But we have to claim it. We have to see the light shining in all circumstances. Uh, some years ago, we went to hear a lecture by a man that Swami uh, had met in Europe. He was a, a, a modern saint. His name was Richard Wormbrand. And he was born in Romania, as Swamiji was. But he was persecuted first by the Nazis uh, when they took over Romania. To as a Christian minister, and he was helping people escape. And then when the Nazis were overthrown, the communists came in, and he was even more persecuted, and he was arrested, and was in solitary confinement, and brutalized and tortured for many years. But solitary confinement in these cells under the streets of the city where no light ever came. And he survived, and he I believe he's passed away in the last year or two, but he would travel all over the world talking about his mission for Christ because he was a Christian, that was his faith. But he was giving a lecture in Grass Valley, which is the near town to Ananda village. And Swami Kriyananda and a number of us went to hear him speak. And he described this experience of living in this cell in total darkness for years, the, and the only sound he heard, no sound, no light, the only sound he heard every day was when they opened the grate at the bottom of the door and shoved a tray of, you know, some dismal food in there that they were given once a day. But you looked at him, and he was radiant. He didn't have any teeth they knocked all his teeth out. He had silver teeth. His hair, he was a tall, they'd broken his back many times, but somehow he held himself straight. And his hair was just, he looked like a statue. His face was like iridescent marble. He was just one of the most beautiful human beings I've ever seen. And he talked about the light. He said, you know, in that profound darkness, there's a light that you can see if you go within. And he talked about that. And you could see it was an absolute reality for him. And his wife also had been in prison, not treated with quite the harshness he was, but she traveled with him. And, and so there was a large group of us, and he was speaking at a church in town. And he said, and my wife, and they were elderly, and he said, you can recognize her. She's the very beautiful one in the back. And you turn around and you could see her in a minute because she was just like him. She was filled with light, filled with radiance. So our lives are not, by and large, with these sort of challenges. But as Christ said, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We've all got our stuff. We've all got <laughs> our challenges. We've all got our crosses to bear for Christ. And so look at what's in front of you and look past the form. If people like 
Richard Wormbrand show us the way. He could see the light for in that dark cell. We can see it in the little darknesses that we're faced with. And if you can just concentrate on the light, Swami says, he quoted this in um, our latest, our most recent Touch of Light blog, but in the Raja Yoga, Art and Science of Raja strength to those weaknesses. If you concentrate on higher qualities, you give strength to those. And if you concentrate on the light of God, or the sound, or whatever quality that we're talking of light this morning, if you concentrate on the light, you will become absorbed in that light. And it will change your consciousness so that wherever you go, whatever challenges face you, loss, death, grief, illness, whatever it might be, you can see the light past that time. And then, as it says uh, in, in the Bible, he that has overcome, I will take into my kingdom. He need not, need not go out anymore. He will not go out anymore. What that means is we need not be reborn by compulsion. We will be free because we've broken the hold of delusion. And we, you can't fool me anymore. I know that your light, your consciousness, your goodness is behind every event in my life, in this world. And as Master would say, he would look at his disciples and he would say, if you only knew how beautiful you all are, I see you all as beings of light. And so we are. We just have to accept it, dwell on it, meditate on it. If we see it in, in others, if we see it in events outside of ourselves, no matter how challenging, then little by little, as they say in the time, po -po -po -po, we will start to see it in ourselves. And may we all be one in that life. <laughs>